Hey there nation and welcome to the show where we help you to play miniatures wargaming on a budget. It is I, Commander Cheapskate, and we are back with another episode of Commander Cheapskate Gamer Reviews. And on this episode we will be taking a look at the Warhammer Army's Project 9th Edition rules for Warhammer Warriors of Chaos Army book. So for those of you guys who are tuning in for the very first time for these cheap gate, uh, Cheapskate Gamer Reviews, what we've been doing has been slowly going through Matthias Eliasson's Warhammer's Army Project. Now the Warhammer's Army Project is an unofficial resource that players can use in order to download army books as well as rules and supplements for Warhammer Fantasy Battle. Now the nice thing about this project though is that Matthias Eliasson has actually created a lot of materials for 8th edition Warhammer Fantasy. And he's actually made rule books for armies and factions that never received army books of their own. Things like the Femir for example have their own rule book, Hobgoblins, Dogs of War, Pirates of Sartosa, those kind of units. Units that you don't really really see because Games Workshop for a reason never made those rule books available. Now, at the same time, he's also gone ahead and made an unofficial 9th edition rule pack. He's actually got rules for the entire game as well as rule updates for all the army books. And he's actually done this free of charge and is available to download for free on PDFs on his blogger site. So on this episode, we'll be taking a look at the Warriors of Chaos, we'll be taking a look at their army rules, we'll also be looking at the army list, special characters, magic, magical items, etc. So that being said, let's get this video review on a roll. All right, so the first thing we're going to actually talk about is the army rules real quick. So as you can see here, as we go through this document, it's actually very well done. As you can see, he's got really awesome desktop publishing going on, as well as artwork for his document. In fact, if you didn't know any better, you would assume this was actually an official document that was actually created by Games Workshop. So he does a beautiful job doing that. And as you can see here, we also have a table of contents as well. It talks about the lore, as well as the army lists and the special characters, as well as the army lists themselves. Now, we're not really going to spend too much on the lore on this one, because if you really want to dive into it, you can do that in your own time. But the thing that we're really going to be reviewing real quick are the different rules real fast. So let's go ahead and get started about that with our army rules real quick. So let me go ahead and, uh, go ahead and zoom in here a little bit so that you guys can see it better. So once again, Eye of the Gods has relatively made the change, and actually it's pretty much buffed a little bit now. It actually accounts for when you destroy non-expendable units as well. So not only are you killing monsters as well as characters, but anytime that your unit destroys, completely destroys in a non-expendable unit, you actually get bonuses for your characters. So that part is kind of nice as well. At the same time, you have this new special rule coming up called Will of the Gods. This one's actually really nice. One allows you to reroll failed panic tests, which is another buff that this army actually gets, which is actually kind of nice. And the reason why is because uh, one of the major problems that Wars of Chaos have always had is that their leadership has always been pretty mediocre for the units. So having that ability to reroll panic tests is also kind of nice as well. At the same time, demonic rules have relatively remained the same as well, except now they have immunity towards poison attacks, which is actually another buff, which is actually kind of strange because a lot of these army book rules I've been going through uh, has been mainly nerfs for the most part, but this one actually gave them a little bit of a buff, which is actually kind of interesting. Now, especially since poison attacks actually gets plus one to wound now, is what they do for this edition, so that part's kind of nice too. Now, at the same time, when it comes to your marks of chaos, let's go and talk about that. Sorcerer weapons still say the same, nothing wrong there. When it comes to your Marks of Chaos though, it's a little bit of a nerf on this one and the reason why is because both your General as well as your Battle Center Bearer must have the same Mark uh, of Chaos if they're going to be in the army together. So that part is kind of a nerf a little bit. Um, in, in early editions of Warhammer Fantasy, you didn't necessarily have to do that too much. They could have different gods that they worshipped, but in this case though, they must be the same and that's a bit of a nerf in that one, but that's okay though. At the same time, let's go and talk about the uh, marks real quick. Mark of Corn relatively made the same, nothing changed there. But Mark of Nurgle though has actually changed quite significantly. Now when you have a Mark of Nurgle, you actually get plus one to your toughness characteristic. However though, there is a negative, you lose two to your initiative. And so that's represent the fact that because you know Nurgle fighters are big and bloated, they're tougher, but at the same time they also can be a little bit slower. I can understand the rule change on this one, so I'm gonna count this one as a buff, just because that plus one toughness is really nice, and having that minus two leadership does, oh, no, sorry, not leadership, to your initiative also makes sense, so no complaints there. At the same time, the mark of Slanesh also received a buff as well. You do have immune psychology, which has always been the case, but now you have the stubborn special rule attached to those guys as well. So because that's really going to help out Slanesh units too. So that's a nice little addition there. And of course, uh, mark of Sneech has actually not changed at all, so we're not going to worry about that too much. So now that we're done talking about those guys, let's go ahead and talk about Eyes of the Gods. Eye of the Guard table has relatively remained the same for the most part, so we're not going to spend too much time on that one and we'll move on to our actual units. 
Now, Chaos Lords have relatively made the same, so we're not going to spend too much time on those guys. The same thing with Exalted Champions. Uh, they pretty much remain the same, too, in terms of their stats and other things, so not too much complaints there. Now, for your Chaos Sorcerers, however, there is a slight nerf with their Magic Lore, so let's go and talk about those guys real quick. So, stat-wise, they remain relatively the same. However, though, they've actually kind of nerfed them a little bit. So, if you have a Chaos Sorcerer who is unaligned, who's not aligned to any of the Chaos Gods, they can choose from Lore of Fire, Lore of Metal, and Lore of Shadows, or Lore of Death, which has always been the standard with these guys, so no, no complaints there. The problem though now is that if you do take a Chaos Mark for your Chaos Sorcerer, you do have to use that specific lore as well. So for example, let's pretend you're a lore of Zneech character, for example. Uh, you have to, I'm sorry, Mark of Zneech character, you have to take the lore of Zneech. If you're a Nurgle Mark, you have to take lore of Nurgle, Slanesh, and so forth. So before in earlier editions, you had some flexibility. You could either choose that lore or a different lore. Now they take that choice away from you. It's entirely what they, what you, you have to entirely take that lore choice if you get it. Narratively speaking, I understand why they made that change, but as a gamer who likes flexibility and doesn't like being limited by things, I can't, it doesn't really, it kind of bothers me a little bit, but that's just me personally. So moving on, we now have a brand new unit now, it's called a Slaughter Priest, which is actually one of the new updates that came in. Now the Slaughter Priest is nice because this is actually from Warhammer Age of Sigmar. So let's talk about this character for a little bit. So he's got a movement characteristic of 4 inches, 6 weapon skill, 3 ballistic skill, 5 strength, so he's really strong, 4 toughness, 2 wounds, 5 initiative, 3 attacks, 8 leadership. He's got the Eye of the Gods as well as Magic Resistance 1, he's also got the Mark of Corn as well as Will of the Gods special rules. So let's talk about this guy a little bit more in detail. You have Scorn of Sorcery. A Slayer Priest channels Dispel Dice and gets plus 1 Dispel in the same manner as a level 2 wizard. So this guy is kind of a nice little buff that we get there as well. At the same time, you also have Blood Fueled Prayers, so now this guy has Bound Spells, what this character actually has. They have two power spells, uh, both of them are higher level 4. In addition, Slaughter Priests get plus 1 to cast for each unsaved wound they cause in close combat in the previous turn. So, that's also really nice too. This is not only a wizard that can also generate power, but they can also do so if they kill people in combat, so that's really powerful in that. Now, the first one is called Blood Boil. And it's a direct damage spell with a range of 12 inches. The target unit suffers D6 strength 5 hits, which ignore armor saves. This has no effect against models with the ethereal, animated construct, or four spirit special rules. So, yeah, you're not really going to do much against undead, which kind of makes sense in one sense, because they don't have any blood. And at the same time, four spirits don't either, so it kind of makes sense to make that, that decision. Then you also have another one called Bloodbind, and this is an augment spell, or hex spell, depending on what you use it for. It's got a range of 18 inches that casts on an unengaged unit. The target must immediately move forward using the random movement 2d6 special rule. This unit has no effect on models with the immunity psychology rule, though frenzy units are still affected. So that part's actually kind of nice too. So it'll be able to get you quicker across the battlefield to engage your enemy, or if your enemy is being stubborn and doesn't want to come to you, you can actually make them come to you. So that way you can defeat them that way. So that part is really nice there. So I thought that was kind of a nice little addition. And it's probably neat because now you could actually put this in a corn army, and actually all corn army actually, and have a better uh, buff for your magic. Now, of course, we have our Demon Princes here. Demon Princes have relatively remained the same for the most part from what I've seen, so not much of a change there. Um, of course, you do have the magic once again. That's kind of a sad thing there. They can either use fire, metal, death, or shadow. Ogalus, of course, they are a demon with a mark, in which case they got to use their respective uh, marks on that one. After that, we also have our Chaos Marauders. Those guys are relatively made the same, so not much really different there. Now, we do have some changes, however, with what's known as Elite Marauders. Now, for Elite Marauders, they're pretty much the same as normal Marauders. The only difference, though, is they get plus one of their strength and plus one initiative. So a little bit faster in combat, as well as have a better strength characteristic. So that's really about it. Now, when it comes to your guys' Elite Marauders, they do talk about this. It says Chaos Marauders and Marauder Horsemen have the option to become upgraded to Elite. You may upgrade one unit to Elite Marauders for each unit of Marauders on the same type and unit size in your army. So you have to have one for one, basically. So you just can't have one unit of Elite Marauders. Um, you have to actually have a unit of Chaos Marauders and then an Elite unit of Marauders for one-on-one, -on -one, which would be kind of nice to add some flexibility to your core requirements. So that part's kind of nice. You also have a brand new character called a Marauder Chieftain, which is also kind of nice too. Uh, this character's got four movements, six weapon skill, three ballistic skill, four strength and toughness, two wounds, five initiative, three attacks, eight leadership. And of course they have the Eye of the Gods and Will of the Gods special rule as well, which is kind of nice. So that way if you have a little bit of buff for your Marauder units when they're in close combat. We also have another unit called Marauder Hunters as well. These guys can be listed as skirmishers. They're pretty much identical to Marauder Chaos Marauders, but we'll talk about these guys a little bit more when we actually get to the army list because the Marauder Hunters really shine when it comes to the uh, different equipment that they can take. So that part's kind of nice as well. 
So continue on with the Marauder Love, we also have our Marauder Horsemen, so those guys are still the same. And of course we have Elite Marauder Horsemen that you could also get too. We'll talk about those guys a little bit later. But we also have a brand new unit called the Marauder Chariot. They're bringing these back from the earlier editions of Warhammer Fantasy. The Chariot's got a strength like a 5, 4 toughness, 4 wounds. And of course you've got your Charioteers and your War Horses having the same, same type of uh, deal going on. They also have an armor save of 5, which is actually kind of nice. So now you could have Marauder uh, Chariots in your army. So they really did a lot to help buff up uh, Marauders in this edition of the rule sets. Now let's talk about Chaos Warriors. Chaos Warriors are really rel relatively made the same, except for one thing. They have a 1 minus less in their initiative now, so instead of an initiative 5, they're only initiative 4. It's a slight nerf, and I don't like when people nerf things like that, but that's just me. But there you go, there you have that, yeah, that minus 1 to their initiative. So they're a little bit slower in close combat, so that's one of the problems you might run into. At the same time, Chaos Knights have also been nerfed as well a little bit. Uh, Stat-wise, they're all exactly still the same. The problem, though, is that they lost their fear rule, special rule. Now. They have been nerfed because they don't have fear, but I can understand the change a little bit just because um, Matthias Eliason has changed how fear impacts units now. So I can I can I can understand why they made that rule change. But at the same time, though, these are also Chaos Knights. They're they're supposed to be feared. So you know, in terms of the lore and stuff, they should have that. But like I said, I do understand it. But you know, that's the case there. Now Chaos Chariots. Now Chaos Chariots have remain relatively the same for the most part, but there's some huge nerfs on these guys. So let's go and talk about how these Chaos Chariots are nerfed. One of the problems, of course, is the Chariot has armor save of a six up. Now, I don't know if this is a typo. I think this probably is for the most part, just because why would a Marauder Chariot have an armor save of five up on a Chaos Armor? Uh, chaos Chariot only has an armor save of six up. I think it's supposed to be a four up, just like it was in previous editions. However, though, that's one thing, so I'm not really nitpicking on that. But the real reason why it's been nerfed, in my opinion, isn't because of this, because I think this is a typo, to be honest. The problem, though, is that they made Chaos Chariots no longer core. Chaos Chariots are now special choices. You can no longer take them as core, and I call nonsense on that one. That's just something that just kind of sticks with me in the wrong way, and so I do cause it. I do say that's been a nerf on that one. So you can no longer do the whole, like, NASCAR build with your uh, Chaos Chariots anymore. You can't have all mounted options uh, for your core anymore with Chaos Chariots, so that part's kind of sad. Gorpy's Chariots have also been nerfed as well. Now, let's talk about this one real quick. So once again, they got that armor save of six up. I don't know if that is a typo or not because it seems kind of weird that you would give a lower armor save to a bigger unit, but whatever the case may be. The reason why they've been nerfed a little bit is because they took away Killing Blow for the unit. So the Gore Beast Chariot no longer gets Killing Blow on its impact hits and only causes fear, which I guess is kind of cool, but at the same time though, kind of a nerf for the most part. So let's keep on going when we're talking about our units now. So we have Chosen, of course. Chosen have relatively remained the same, so not much change has gone there, so we can skip that unit. Now we do have the Varangard, which is a new unit that's in this edition. The Varangard are actually a unit from Warm Age of Sigmar, if I remember correctly. And so that's what they're going to be making their opinions here as well. So let's go ahead and talk about them real quick. There's all their lore. For their uh, actual um, stats, for the Vanguard, you have a 4-inch movement, 6 weapon skill, 3 ballista skill, 5 strength, 4 toughness, 1 wound. 5 initiative, 2 attacks, as well as 8 leadership. And of course, you've got your favorite, the Ever Chosen. He's got that one additional attack, which makes him a little bit different. Their demonic mounts have 8 movement, 4 weapon skill, 5 strength, 4 toughness, 3 wounds. They have uh, five, uh, 3 initiative, 2 attacks, as well as 8 leadership. They also got the demonic special rule for their mounts. They got devastating charge, which gives them the additional attack when they charge in the rule of chaos. And they count as monstrous uh, infantry, uh, cavalry, which is actually kind of cool. I think it's kind of a nice little, uh, little detail that they add for these guys. One of the things I think is really cool about that fact is that they actually have included some Age of Sigmar units, which is always a good thing and really, really help out with the development of your of your units, especially if you want to do cross-play with Warhammer Age of Sigmar units as well as other units as well. So that part is kind of nice. So it's one of those nice little features they have about it. Now, the next thing we're going to talk about real quick are Skull Reapers. So these guys are the same, pretty much the same thing that you have from uh, the end time rules that you guys came up. These were the, the infantry, almost monstrous infantry types that you had earlier from uh, what you call it, from additional uh, from the end times. So those guys relatively remain the same. Not going to spend too much time with those guys. Wrathmongers, exactly the same thing. Uh, pretty much the same from when they were in the end times as well. So we're not going to worry about that too much. And of course, same thing as your Skull Crushers, they relatively remain the same as well. And now, they do cause impact hits, which is actually kind of nice. They actually add D3 to the impact hits, so that part's kind of cool. So, kudos to that. 
Now, one of the new units they have now are Fate Masters. So, and this is a new unit. This is for his niche units, which is actually kind of nice. So let's go and talk about those real quick. So, the Fate Master has a four movement, five weapon skill, three ballista skill, four strength and toughness, two wounds, four initiative, two attacks, eight leadership. Doomseer has an additional attack. And of course, they're mounted on Discus Niche. So, let's talk about this real quick. So, they have that Flying Calvary, which is nice. They also got Demon's Niche for the Discus Niche, as well as Fly. They also come with Marcus Niche and Willow. Uh, Will uh, Will of Chaos. Now these guys are also equipped with Fire Glaives. A Fire Glaive follows the rules for a Polearm, so basically a Halberd with a plus one strength, but they also have Flaming Attacks and Magical Attack Special, which is nice as well. And they have this new rule called Master of Fate. Fate Masters and any friendly units within eight inches of them may reroll ones when taking armor saves. So that part's kind of nice uh, seeing that upgrade as well. Now the really cool thing about these guys is that they have this special rule called Covenant Sneech, which means a unit of Fate Masters considered to be a level two wizard and know the spells Blue Fire as Niche as well as Pink Fire as Niche from the Lord's Niche. This doesn't prevent other friendly wizards from knowing the same spells. Each time the unit casts a spell or is a target by a special rule that affects a wizard, you must nominate one Fate Master or Doomsayer as the caster for the purpose of line of sight, range, etc. In the event of a Fate Master's unit rolling a miscast, do not roll on the miscast table. Instead, the unit suffers D3 wounds with no saves of any kind allowed. So once again, we start seeing this nice little unit, which is actually kind of cool. These guys come in units of three, which is really nice. So you can start seeing a little bit more of buff uh, being used for these guys as well, which is kind of cool. Um, there are no miniatures that I can think of yet that you could use this for. You could, of course, buy the uh, 40k version of these guys, uh, which I think are just called uh, Sorcerers on uh, Discs of Niche, I think is what they're called, or a Coven. I forgot what they're called, but they're a 40k unit. There's three of them. You could easily do some conversion on those guys and use them to make your Fate Masters. So I think that is a really cool new addition to this as well. And, of course, we have our Putrid Blight Clings for our Nurgle units. We have these guys from the end times, so not too much, uh, not too reason to stay on those guys too much. Now, we do have a new unit called the Pus Goyle Blight Lord. This is a brand new unit that's available to these guys. Once again, these are also from Warhammer Age of Sigmar, so for those of you guys who want to do crossplay, this is a really nice additional to that. So let's go ahead and talk about these guys real quick. So, your Blight Lord has four movements, six weapon skill, three ballista skill, four strength, five toughness, two, weapon uh, two wounds, three initiative, three attacks, eight leadership. You got the plus one for the Lord of Affliction, and you got your Rot Fly Miracle, which is one Minch Movement. They got three Weapon Skill, zero Blissa Skill, four Strength, five Toughness, three Wounds, two Initiative, three Attacks, as well as seven Leadership. They're also Monstrous Cavalry. The Rot Fly, of course, has Demonic as well as Demon Nurgle Special Rules. They got the Hover ability on them, Mark of Nurgle, which is included already in the profile. They got Poison Attacks for the Rot Fly only. And they have Will of Chaos. And then, of course, you have your Death Head, which is a shooting attack. It's got a 12-inch range, 4 strength, causes D3, multiple wounds, poison attacks, and quick to fire. So this is actually really, really cool to see these being brought in. That's one of the cool things I really like about this is the fact that you see these new units uh, being brought in from Age of Sigmar over to uh, Warhammer Fantasy, which is great. So that way you can create that cross-play ability, which is really nice. Now, of course, we have our Hellstriders of Slanesh. These guys have remained pretty much the same, so we're not going to be talking about those guys too much. So they're doing pretty good there. Uh, same thing with our Forsaken. We've already talked about these guys as well. They have their still Fictus mutations, still their D3 random attacks. Pretty much have the same abilities there as well as their upgrades for their marks. So we're not going to spend too much time on those guys. Now, we do have a new unit, though, called Flarekin. So let's go ahead and talk about the Flarekin of Clan Mulder. So these guys are actually from the End Times rules, I believe. I think that's where they're from. Or maybe they're a forge rule unit. It's one of those two. But basically, they have four weapon skill, four uh, movement, four weapon skill, three ballistic skill, three strength and toughness, one wound, four initiative, one attack, seven leadership, plus one for the wall creeper. Their infantry, they have scout special rule, which is kind of nice. They have skirmishers, wills, wolf chaos, and they have human chains, which says that Flare can may scale buildings and walls as if they were open terrain. In addition, they ignore penalties for fighting enemies behind defended obstacles. So these would be good for like something if you're doing like siege rules, you'll definitely want to use these guys. Or if you want to do war machine hunting, this could all really help you out as well. So it's kind of a nice little choice you got there. At the same time, we have a brand new unit called the Chaos Cultus, which is actually kind of nice. So if you're looking for some cheap core options, these are your guys. They do under they all do kind of under the expendable rules, so you do have to worry about that. But let's talk about their stats real quick. So their stats are four movement, three weapon skill, ballista skill, strength and toughness, one wound. They got three initiative, one attack, six leadership. They got the plus one attack for the cult leader. But the nice thing about these guys, they have ambushers. So this would be a nice way to kind of mess with your enemy's ranks, mess up with your enemy's plans. If you're finding an enemy who's mainly a defensive shooting enemy, like a dwarf gunline, for example, you could pop these guys up right behind your opponents and attack them, which is really nice. And plus, because they're expendable, if they die, it's not going to freak out anybody if they get destroyed. So that part is kind of nice as well. So now let's go and talk about war shrines real quick. 
So War Shrines, War Shrines is kind of a mixed bag. There is some nerfing at the same time, some buffing going on as well. So it's kind of hard to say. It's kind of like I said before, it's kind of like a mixed bag. So let's go and talk about the shrine real quick. Stat wise, they relatively remain the same as well. So not too much there for the most part. They did nerf them a little bit because now you only have a five award save instead of a four award save, but that's not such a big deal because ward saves now stack. So that part's kind of nice. Now the giver of glory ability, so this will relatively remain the same. So because of that, that's pretty much done. However, though they've kind of they've kind of add some new things to this now by adding these new favor of the ruinous powers. So let's go ahead and talk about that real quick. So you have an innate balance spell power level three, augment spell the range of 18 inches. If the war shrine has been dedicated to a particular god, the shrine master must instead pray to the patron of their favor. So we do have that as well. So that's one of the things. So you do have this going on. So first of all. If you have your mark of K, uh, if you have a, just a normal unmarked, which would then you just chaos unaligned, what ends up happening is that you may reroll uh, to hit moon wounds of one for corn. Uh, basically, you start your next magic phase, the target may reroll all filled hit wounds for favor of Nurgle. What ends up happening is that until the start of your next magic phase, the target unit can reroll all filled to wound rolls for favor is Nietzsche. Uh, for this one, it says until the start of your next magic phase, the target unit gains ward save a six up special rule, may reroll ones when taking ward saves. Which is nice because you know ward save stack and then favor of slanesh on this one of Karx it talks about till your next turn uh the target gains immune psychology units with marcus slanesh become unbreakable instead and reroll fill charges and pursuit distances so like i said it's kind of like a mixed bag on this one uh, there are some nerfs a lot of buffs but at the same time though the big nerf of this one though is that they moved this from a special and they made it into a rare choice now so that is something you want to take in consideration when we're talking about the chaos war shrine so like i said kind of a mixed bag on that one now, Chaos Warhounds, of course, have remained relatively the same. They also come with Vanguard. I believe you had to purchase that originally for points, so they got a little bit of a buff there, so that's kind of nice. And we have a new unit called Skin Wolves. These are actually from the Forge World line of miniatures. Um, so let's talk about their stats real quick. Very, very quick. Seven movement, five weapon skills, zero ballistic skill, four strength of toughness, three wounds, five initiative, three attacks, seven leadership. They're a monstrous beast with frenzy, as well as regeneration five up, as well as a will of chaos. You can upgrade them with a Mark of Corn, which gives them a plus one strength bonus when charging. Marcus Nietzsche gives them a regeneration of four up. Mark of Nurgle basically gives them poison attacks, and Mark of Slanesh makes them always strike for a special rule. So this is kind of a nice, like a nice little flanking, harassing you that you could use to assault the flanks of your enemies. So it's actually kind of nice to see that as well. Another new unit that we also have, oh, well, sorry, not another unit. We have the Chaos Spawn. That has remained the same, nothing changed there. But the big one is that we have a giant Chaos Spawn, which is kind of nice now. So once again, we have our random movement characteristic for that guy, but he's D3, 3D6 random movement. He's got 2D6 random attacks. He's also unbreakable, four weapon skill, five strength, six toughness, five wounds, two initiative, 10 leadership. So because of that, this guy is beast. And just like before, you have your different upgrades have remained relatively the same um, from the previous edition. So that part's kind of nice too. Now we have Chaos Trolls once again. Chaos Trolls do come back. They have Natural Armor 6 up now, which is nice. Region of 4 up. So that part's kind of nice. They still have their Vomit Attacks. They still have their wonderful stats there. So not much has changed. Chaos Ogres have remained un unchanged for the most part as well. Uh, they did take away that D3 impact hits if you will 10 or higher. But, you know, them's the breaks. Dragon Ogres have relatively remained the same as well. So we're not going to spend too much time on those guys. Oh, except for that they now have the new the new um, lightning attack immunity. So they actually have that new rule now because I forgot about that. Lightning attacks are an actual special rule now, so they have immunity to do that. Dragon Ogre Shagoths have remained relatively the same there as well. Now we have a new unit called the Giant Spined Chaos Beast. So another big boy is also really quick as well. It's got 7 movement, 3 weapon skill, 6 strength, 5 toughness, 5 wounds, 3 initiative, 5 attacks, 5 leadership. It's got frenzy as well as causes d6 impact hits, regeneration of 5 up. You could of course give it a mark. If it's a mark of corn, it gets plus 1 strength. Mark of Nietzsche has a 6 up ward save. Mark of the Nurgle basically gives poison attacks. And then Mark of Slanesh gives it a 2 up on its initiative. So now you can have this forge rule miniature in your armies causing all kinds of problems. And then, you know, of course, you have your Chaos Giants, which have remained relatively the same, so we're not going to talk too much about that. Still got their special attacks, still do all the interesting things that they've always done. But now we also have a new unit called the Chaos War Mammoth. So for those of you guys who might be old, old uh, players of Necromunda, uh, not Necromunda, of Warhammer, they actually had a Forge World miniature of this. It was a huge War Mammoth, like those elef giant elephant creatures from Lord of the Rings, which is actually kind of cool, these guys. These guys are actually written by Chaos Marauders. 
if I remember correctly on this one. So let's go on and talk about these guys real quick. So it's a monster. It's got immunity psychology, D6 plus one impact hits, five up natural armor. It's got a movement of eight, three weapon skills, seven strength, six toughness, 10 wounds, one initiative, five leadership. And of course you got your Marauder crew running it as well. And just like the Giants, you do have different charts. You have man-sized targets as well as big things charts. And of course you roll randomly to see what kind of attacks that you have on that. We're not going to spend too much on this one because if you want to see exactly what they can do, you can take a look at the um, actual rule books for this one. So that's actually kind of neat. It's kind of cool bringing back the War Mammoth, which I think is really, really neat. It's something I always thought was really cool and evocative of using, especially Chaos Marauders. Like I said, this book does a lot of buffing for Chaos Marauders a lot in this one. Slaughter Boots are here as well. Uh, they've remained the relatively the same. Same thing with your Mutilith Vortex Beast. So not much change going on with those guys. And with Hellcan is now, Hellcan actually have a new attack on this one. So let's go and talk about that real quick. Everything else has remained the same for the most part, except now you have this Spew Icor uh, ability now, which is a new attack force. It's kind of nice. Basically, the Hellcan has a Strength 5 Breath Weapon, and any of that suffers one or more casualties from the Spew Icor, must take a panic test the minus one penalty to their leadership. So because of that, we have this new attack, which is actually really, really cool. And that's one of the neat things about that. So that pretty much makes up the different army rules that you have for your monsters and everything else like that. Manticores remain the same. Chaos Dragons remain the same. Chaos Mounts have all remained the same. Pretty much all this stuff has remained the same for the most part. And now what we're going to talk about now are your special characters. So we'll go talk about that next. So the next thing we're going to talk about real quick are your special characters. So uh, we're going to go through these guys real quick. We have Archeon, uh, Archeon the Ever Chosen. He's relatively remained the same for the most part, so we're not going to spend too much time about this guy. All of his stats and everything else is re relatively remain the same for the most part. Now, however, there are rules to actually play Archeon, who's actually riding on, I think it's called Drogar, which is that huge three-headed monster creature thing that he rides. Um, they do actually have rules for that in a supplement, so... Uh, a Matthias license actually made supplements for special characters for 9th edition Warhammer Fantasy. So if you want to use that character, you can actually download that. And he has actually made additional special characters for all the different armies, which is actually really cool. So that part is really neat too. So we're not going to spend too much time on this guy uh, all that much. Uh, just because we really don't need to uh, for all intents and purposes. So here's Drogar in his horse form is where you have that guy. But he also rides that huge uh, monster too. Now we have a new character named Vardek Krom. I believe this guy might have been in the End Times rule. I didn't really buy the rule book for that, but I do believe he was there. Um, as you can see here, got pretty decent stats. Four movement, nine weapon skill, three ballistic skill, five strength and toughness, three wounds, eight initiative, five attacks, nine leadership. He's got Eye of the Gods, Will of Chaos. He's got Master of Chaos Undivided. If Krom is your army's general, the restrictions on upgrading Chaos Marauders or Marauder Horsemen to Elite Marauders is lifted. However, they may not be given any marks of chaos. You also have Immense Pride while fighting a challenge, Krom will re-roll to hit into wound rolls. And you have the Way of the Warrior. Krom can choose to swap between fighting with a hand weapon and a shield or two hand weapons at the start of each round of combat. If Krom uses a hand weapon, his shield has parry saves increased to four up. And if Krom uses two hand weapons, he gains plus three attacks rather than just plus one. So kind of a cool little character sass he got there as well. Then we have Cardell Shogar is his name. He's this battle standard bearer for the Swords of Chaos. I believe he was in the end times rule, but just in case if he wasn't, let's talk about this guy real quick. He's got four movement, seven weapon skill, three ballistic skill, five strength, four toughness, two wounds, six initiative, four attacks, as well as eight leadership. He's infantry, he's got eye of the gods, as well as chaos. He's got the banner of the gods. Uh, this is the army's battle standard. The bearer of the banner of the gods causes terror, and any enjoyment by him gains the unbreakable special rules. So that part is really, really cool, having that ability. Unbreakable is a powerful, powerful ability. Then we have Valka, uh, Valkaya the Bloody. I believe she's remained really, pretty much the same for the most part, so we're not going to spend too much time on her. Same thing with Village the Cursling. He's the same. Sigvald the Magnificent, still the same as well. At the same time, so is Festus the Leech Lord, so we don't need to worry about those guys too much. However, we have also have Scylla Angerfim. He's also remained the same too, for the most part, as a giant chaos spawn uh, monster. And then we have Wolfric the Wanderer, of course. He's also remained unchanged for the most part too, so... He's still good to go as well. We also have Galrausch, which is the first of the Chaos Dragons. He's remained the same for the most part, so I'm not going to spend too much time on him. Same thing with Kolex Sun Eater. He's exactly the same thing. Throg, the King of the Trolls, is still the same. And yes, you can still take uh, Chaos, Dwar uh, Chaos Trolls as a core, so that's always cool as well. So the special characters have remained the same as well. Same thing with the spells. Um, the spells have been pretty much 
pretty much the same for the most part. The only difference though in this one, if you guys notice, uh, when it comes to the Laura's Niche, you don't have that uh, Warp Fire rule anymore. So because I don't have to worry about getting your opponent's regeneration saves. So for those of you guys who are kind of hesitant of using the Laura's Niche, you really don't need to worry about that anymore because the Warp Fire rule is now gone. So there we have that. That's also taken care of. Other than that though, the rest of the spells have Rune Mitch pretty much made the same, so we're not going to spend too much time on those guys. So the next thing we're going to talk about now are Chaos Mutantations as well as Chaos Powers. We're going to spend some time on this because there has been some significant changes done for this one. Alright, so when it comes to Chaos Mutations and Powers, there have been a lot of changes done on these guys. So let's go ahead and talk about exactly what happens to these guys for the most part. So, we now basically have Chaos Powers that are unaligned, so anybody can take them. And you also have Chaos Mark specific uh, mutations and powers as well. So first of all, we have the Mantle of Chaos, which costs 55 points. Any missile attacks targeting the character or the unit that they are with have its strength halved, rounding up. And this has no effect against magical attacks. So very, very powerful ability right there as well. We also have Chaos Familiar, which has remained the same. Terrifying Appearance now gives you the Terror Special Rule. We have Wings for 25 points, which means you can now fly. We have Flaming Breath for 25 points. Now, this one has a little bit of a nerf because it's only a Strength 3 weapon now, so that part's kind of sad. We also have Distendable Maul, which costs 20 points. It says instead of making a usual attack, the character can choose to make a special attack against a single infantry model. If the attack hits, the enemy model must pass an initiative test. If this test is failed, the victim is swallowed whole, is removed from game with no saves allowed. So. That's actually kind of interesting right there. And of course we have Fearsome Aura for 20 points, which gives enemies within six inches of this character minus one to the leadership, which is really kind of nice, because especially if you decide to use Spam or Terra in order to get that across. So after that, we also have what's called Diabolic Splendor, which costs 20 points. Any successful leadership test taken by enemy unit in base contact with the character must be rewarded. Rerolled. This is mutation cannot be combined with Fearsome Aura. So that part's kind of sad. That is kind of a nerf, but you know, thumbs the brakes, I guess. Uh, soul Feeders remain the same, same thing with Burning Body, uh, Beast Steel Facade, now gives the character Fear, Scale Skin gets you now an armor save of 6 up, kind of nerfed that a little bit, but they also drop a point too. We have Extra Arm for 5 points, which means you get additional arm with that, we also have Tentacle, which costs 5 points, the character may grapple a single opponent in base contact, forcing to lose 1 attack, however, the character is not allowed to use a shield or any weapon that requires 2 hands, so we do have that rule. Unholy Strike has relatively remained the same, and same thing with Poison Slime, that has remained the same as well. Now beyond that, of course, we also have Horns, which gives you impact hits for 5 points, Cloven Hooves, which gives you 1 additional movement for 5 points, but you can't combine it with Serpent Body. We'll talk about that when we get to uh, Slanesh. And we have Acid Eye Core for 5 points, which basically suffers a Strength 4 hit every single time you get hit on that one. So those are the unaligned powers. At the same time, we now have specific powers for each of the different Chaos Gods. So for Korn, you have Blood Curling Roar for 25 points. This is a magic missile attack, as a missile attack with a 12 inch range. The target takes 2d6 strength 2 hits, which ignores armor saves. We have Blood Fever, which is 25 points. The character will never lose his frenzy for any reason. In addition, any unit, friend or foe that is in base contact with them at the start of their movement phase becomes subject to frenzy for the remainder of that turn. If they already have Frenzy Special Roll, they instead gain a plus one attack, but will have to reroll any successful Berserk Rage rolls. You also have the Fury of the Blood God for 25 points. The model gains a Hatred Special Roll. Any wizard within 12 inches of the character suffers minus D3 to their casting rolls. So this would be really nice to use for like your Slaughter Priest, uh, for example. Same thing with Collar of Corn. As a Talisman, the character has a Magic Resistance 2, which gives you a 20 points on that one. You also have Deafening Bellow for 20 points. On the turn that the character charges all enemy units in base contact, suffer minus one to hit with close combat. This would be another good one to put on your Slaughter Priest as well for your corn armies. Now let's talk about powers of Zneech. So, for Tendrils of Zneech, cost 30 points. Wizards only. The wizard may reroll a single power or dispel dice per player turn. And this may potentially prevent a miscast. So that part's kind of nice. Protean form, which costs 25 points, gives you a 5 of regeneration rule. Conjoined Homunculus is a wizard only. Once per turn, the character may choose to add D3 to his casting result after attempting to cast a spell. This extra dice cannot cause a miscast or count towards ultimate power. So another really powerful ability there. And of course, Third Eye's Niche lets you reroll ward saves of 1. That costs you 10 points. Now, let's go on to powers of Nurgle real quick. We have Stream of Corruption that comes back. This character makes a breath, of a breath weapon. All models hit must pass a toughness test or suffer a moon with the Ignore's armor, uh, armor save special rules. So once again, Stream of Corruption makes its way back in again. Massive Bolt gives you one wound. Additional wound for 20 points, which would be really nice for lords and characters. 
Nurgling Infestation costs 15 points. Each model that attacks a character in close combat suffers an automatic strength 3 hit after the attacker's hits have been worked out. This hit occurs even if the character with the Nurgling Infestation is slain and any wounds cost towards, count towards combat resolution. So kind of nice little buff there. We have Secondary Jaws, which is actually kind of horrific if you think about it. Uh, it says this character gains a special attack at Strength 2 with the Always Strikes first and ignores Armor Save Special Rule. And then we have, of course, Nurgle's Rot, which costs 10 points. At the start of every close combat phase, every enemy model in base contact with the character suffers a single Strength 1 hit with the Nord's Armor Save Special Rule. And of course, we got Powers of Slanesh. These are for all of our Slanesh players. We have Hell Shriek, which costs 50 points. One use only. The character can use his ability at the start of any magic phase. Immediately after rolling for the Winds of Magic, all enemy wizards within 18 inches must immediately roll 2d6 on the miscast table. So this is a nice little Hell Heart type of uh, ability that Powers of Slanesh. We also have Word of Agony for 30 points. Once per game, at the beginning of any close combat phase, the bearer of the Word of Agony can choose a model in base contact. That model takes D6 Strength 4 hits, which ignores armor. So another really powerful ability there, too. Now we have Serpent Body, which costs 15 points. Model on foot only. The champion gains plus 2 movement and plus 1 initiative. This mutation cannot be combined with Cloven Hooves, for obvious reasons. We have Sp uh, Sporific Musk, which costs 15 points. Uh, when the character unit flees from a character with this gift of the unit they were with, the fleeing unit rolls an extra d6 and discards the highest dice roll. And then finally, we have Allure of Slanesh for 10 points. Any opponent wishing to strike the character in close combat must first pass a psychology test before rolling to hit. If the test is failed, the model cannot make any close combat attacks that phase. It does not affect attacks that do not roll to hit. So that costs 10 points there. Now, once again, we also have some artifacts now for these guys. So we have the Chaos Demon Sword. Uh, this one adds D3 to the strength and D3 attack, so maximum of 10 each. However, every roll of hit one up uh, basically hits themselves. So this one's actually kind of nice because originally it was D6 attacks that you would get, but I can understand why they made the change because you get that buff to your strength now as well as attacks. So not too uh, torn about that one. Same thing with Hellfire Sword, cost 35 points. Uh, flaming attacks and Mars armor save. A body explodes in flames. We also have the Rending Sword for 45 points. Maybe roll fail to wound rolls and the multiple wounds of D3 special rules. So that's a nice little buff there. We have the Crimson Armor of Dargon, which is a full plate armor. It basically makes you immune from killing blows as well as uh, multiple wounds. Also gives you six up uh, uh, ward save on that one as well, which is actually kind of nice. Sorry about that. A little Java thing popped up there. I do apologize for that. At the same time, only cost you 25 points, which is not bad. It's actually pretty good, all things considered. You also have the Helm of Many Eyes, which also costs 20 points as well. It gives you a one-up armor save, and you always gain the only strike first, as well as the pity rules, as always, because that's just standard right there. So moving on, we have the Crown of Everlasting Conquest, which is a new uh, magic item. It costs 50 points. Uh, basically, have a regeneration of four-up rule. In addition, gives the bearer the Inspiring Presence rule to friendly units within six inches. If worn by a general, his Inspiring Presence range is increased by another six inches, which is actually kind of nice. We have the Book of Secrets of 40 points. The Book of Secrets, which is a brand new magical item, allows the wizard to choose an additional spell from each of the lores of Fire, Shadow, and Death, following the normal rules for choosing spells. This does not give them any additional access to any signature spells, however. In addition, they get plus one to channel power dice, but do not channel power. Uh, do not channel any dispel dice. At this bear miscast, we'll do six on the miscast table and choose the highest result. So we do have that as well. And then last, we have the Chalice of Chaos, uh, Chaos for ten points. It's relatively remained the same as well, so that part's kind of nice. And then we have the Banner of Wrath for twenty-five. It's got a bound spell, level four. The Banner of Wrath contains a magic missile with a range of twenty-four inches. If cast, it causes D six strength four hits, and this is a lightning attack as well. And that costs twenty-five points there too. So now that we're done talking about chaos mutations, powers, and magic items, let's go ahead and talk about the army lists. All right, so the next thing we're talking about now is the army list for those guys. So let's go and talk about the point values and what they can take now. So first of all, for Lords, Archeon costs 575. If you decide to mount him on Drogar, which is actually kind of nice, it gains 50 points for that, so that's kind of cool. Vardak Krom costs 250. Galrausch is 525. Kolek is 465. Valkaya the Bloody is 350, Sigvald the Magnificent is 335, Vichelich the Cursling is 385 for that character. Then of course you have a Chaos Lord, 185 points on this one. Once again they have a huge selection of weapons they can take as well as marks, as well as different steeds they can take as well. So your spell for chant choices for your mounts. Uh, Chaos Demon Princess costs 270 points now, and they can actually take medium armor or light armor. So they don't automatically come with Chaos Armor, like I said before, so it's a little bit of a nerf on that one. 
So that part's kind of sad too. You can take your marks and stuff like that, and you can take Kai's mutations and powers up to a total of 150 po 100 points. A Demon Prince of Corn may take up to 150 points, so that's kind of neat, I guess. At the same time, let's go and talk about your guys' uh, characters real quick for this one. So when it comes to your Chaos Lords on this one, for your Chaos Sorcerer Lord, he costs 215 points there. Once again, the Chaos Armor now is called Full Play Armor is what it's called now, so you can get that for 12 points. Uh, what else do we have? We have all your different marks as well. You got your different steeds, so not much challenges there now. We also have your heroes. Cordell, Shogar, he costs 190 points. Wolfric the Mourner is 140. Throg is 265. Festus the Leech Lord is 215. Scylla Angerfim is 105. Your Exalt heroes cost 110 points. Once again, spoil for choices on this one as well. And they can also take uh, Magical Standard Bear. Yeah, they can be taking Chaos Mutations and Magic Items up to 50 points in uh, total for that one. Our Chaos Sorcerers cost 100 points. They can take Full Plate Armor as well for 8. And of course, all the different various upgrades you have for those guys too. Now, your Slaughter Priest, which is one of those new units, costs 115 points. They can be equipped with a great weapon. They can also take medium armor, which is kind of nice. They can be mounted on a Chaos War Shrine of Corn for 95 points, and they can take Chaos Mutations and Power and or Magic Items up to 50 points, so that's actually really nice. You can really combine those with your powers and a Dispel Scroll, for example, and that can really cause your opponent some problems. Now, you have your Marauder Chieftain. It costs 55 points, that new Marauder character, and, of course, they have all their various things that they can take as well, so that part's kind of nice. Now you also have your core units, your Chaos Warriors cost 16 points, as you can see they have a magic standard for 25, they can take marks, they can take their weapons now. They've actually included flails now in their unit, which is actually kind of nice, you can take that if you want to, which is really cool. Chaos Marauders cost 5 points now as well, and all their different equipment that they can also take too, and of course if you want to upgrade into Elite Marauders, that's going to cost you an additional 1.5 points per character. Uh, per fighter, but remember you have to have the equal amount of marauders as you do elite marauders, so you know Dems the brakes on that one now. You also got your marauder hunters. So let's talk about these guys real quick They come with hand weapons and throwing axes. They're also skirmishers They can also take your marks as well, but they can also be equipped with javelins and short bows now So that's kind of nice so shooting elements They really didn't have much shooting for a chaos army in the past But now you can actually get some pretty healthy amount of shooting choices now especially with your marauder hunters Marauder Horsemen, of course, will remain relatively the same as well, but they can also take Javelins and Short Bows, too, so that part's kind of neat, too, so they got that shooting ability. They also cost 12 points apiece. Now, for your core units, the Marauder Chariot costs 70 points, so that's new, and of course, we have our various marks as well. They can also take Light Armor for 5. They automatically come with Javelins and Pole Arms for them, so that's kind of nice there. Your Forsaken costs 16 points, and they can be integrated to become Skirmishers now, which is absolutely free, so... For those of you guys who wanted to have skirmishing uh, forsaken and use them as screening troops, that's actually really good. So it's kind of a nice little buff there too. Um, Vanguard uh, for your guys' Chaos Warhounds, like I said before, the Vanguard rules there. Poison attacks one point per model, as well as natural armor. It might be worth it to take the poison attacks just because it's added a plus one to wound now. So that part's kind of nice there. Now your Chaos Cultists, which was the new expendable unit we talked about, these guys are three points apiece. You have to take them in units of twenty. They can ambushers and expendable. They can take full commands. They can take shields, additional hand weapons, and flails. They can also take throwing weapons, which is really nice for half a point. And they also could take light armor for one. You probably don't want to take the light armor too much, but the throwing weapons could be really nice because, especially if you pop them up behind enemy lines, they can shoot at units, especially if you're fighting against elves. It'd be kind of nice to use that because elves only have a three up toughness. So, was well, something you might want to consider when using those chaos cultists. Now, as for special units, uh, chaos knights cost 36 points a piece now. They have the option for full upgrades as well, as well as marks. They can also get a source of weapons too. And of course, the cast chair has now been moved to a special choice, which is lame, but I can kind of see why they did what they did there. Same thing with the Garpiece Chariot. They took away its uh, killing blow and it costs 130 points now, so that's kind of lame too. Now, when it comes to your special units, your Skull Reapers cost 34 points now. They can also be upgraded to Skirmishers, which is actually kind of nice. Same thing with your Putrid Blight Kings. They can also be upgraded to Skirmishers for free and cost 32 points per unit. Same thing with Hellstriders of Slanesh, uh, they can of course, they remain relatively the same there as well. Chaos Chosen now costs 18 points, uh, relatively remain the same with their choices of equipment that they can take. Those Flare King guys we talked about earlier cost 6 points apiece. These ones are more like, um, how can I say it, they're more like, uh, it's kind of like a little too specific what they can do. You know, they mainly made to attack fortifications, so you may not want to take them, but it might just be worth it just because you want that scout ability, so that part's kind of nice. Skin Wolves look really, really cool. They cost 38 points per model, and of course you can upgrade them with their marks, which is really, really nice there as well. 
You also have your Chaos Ogres. Uh, they remain relatively the same, so not much change there. Same thing with your Dragon Ogres, as well as Chaos Trolls, except Chaos Trolls now can take not light armor, which is nice. That makes them have a 5-up armor with a 4 regen. That'd be really, really cool. Especially if you take them as core units, if you take Throg, that could really help you out right there, so that's kind of nice. Chaos Spawn are now, are now special choices, so that part's kind of cool. They cost 40 points apiece, and of course you can give them their marks accordingly, which is nice. At the same time, you have your rare units, your Vanguard costs 72 points per miniature, Wrathmongers cost uh, 44 for those guys. They can also be upgraded to be Skirmishers absolutely free, so that's kind of nice, especially with those impact as they give with those uh, Wrath Flows that they carry. Your Skull Crushers have always been rare choices. They cost 77 points now. They can still take their typical uh, Enforce weapon there too. Fate Masters that we talked about earlier, those guys are 46 points per miniature, so those are the guys that we talked about earlier. Same thing with your Pesquoil Blight Lords. They cost 67 points per unit, and the Death Heads upgrade costs uh, 7 points uh, per miniature. Your Chaos War Shrine, like we said before, those are now 100 points, and of course you have your different marks that you can take for that, so that is a rare unit now. Of course you have your Dragon Ogre Shagoth, who costs uh, 225 points, as well as your Giant Spined Chaos Beast, that guy costs 220 points. And of course you do have your different marks you can take for your Chaos Spine Beast. And your Chaos Giant costs 200 points, they got their marks there as well. As well as your giant chaos spawn, they cost 195 points, and their marks are located there below. And then lastly, of course, you got your chimera, your slaughter brutes, and your Middle-Earth vortex beasts, as well as your hell cannons. Those remain the same for the most part. And lastly, you have your chaos war mammoth, which is 325 points, and he comes with five marauder crewmen, is what they basically come with too. They also armored javelins, and that pretty much makes up your army list for this one. All right, folks, and there you have it. This is our overall review of uh, Warhammer Army Project's uh, 9th edition Warhammer Rules for Warriors of Chaos Army book. And once again, this is available to download for free from the Warhammer Army's project on Blogger. Like I said before, Elias, Mathi uh, Elias Mathi uh, Mathiason has done a beautiful job with a lot of the work that he's done with the uh, Army Rule books as well as the 9th edition rules, so it's really, really nice. And in my conclusion, it's kind of nice. This Warhammer, uh, this uh, Warriors of Chaos book is actually a really good um, update, really, to be honest. It gives you a lot of new options for the Wards of Chaos Army, which is always a good thing. Having an, an abundance of different choices that you can use is always a positive one. So I do like those new additions that they actually made to this army book. At the same time, the nerfing on this one is not as bad as I've seen in other rule books. For example, the Wood Elves, High Elves, and Dark Elves, in my opinion, have received the most nerfs of anybody, which is actually kind of a shame. But that's, you know, that's just my opinion. You know me, how I feel about nerfing things and, and balance and all that nonsense. But anyways, the, because they did that, you know, on this one though, not so bad. I could actually understand why they made some of the choices that they did. Not too many complaints on this one. In fact, they actually received a lot of buffs in this book, in my opinion, which is actually kind of nice. And so because of that, it's a pretty solid upgrade. They got a nice update overall. They give you a lot of different options now that you can use for your Wars of Chaos armies. I really like the fact that they've added new Chaos Marauders as well as Cultists and things. It gives you a lot more core choices to choose from, which is really, really nice. They've also bring in some of those Age of Sigmar miniatures into this game as well, which is really nice because you could use that to do cross-playing, which I'm a really big fan of because it helps players save money so overall this is a really solid really well done rule update and i really appreciate the work that Math elias Mathiason has done it does a really good job oh, sorry matthias eliason there we go i'm sorry i'm getting the guy's name wrong i do apologize for that but there you guys have it this is our overall review of uh, where's a cast for ninth edition Warhammer fantasy from army warhammer's project as always, please feel free to like, comment, and or subscribe. Your guys' input is invaluable to us as always. Also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, as well as blogger.com for all the latest, greatest hobby news related to our channel. That's going to do it for this week, guys. We'll catch you guys next one. Peace out and stay classy.